Anyway, this morning, our subject's going to be on love. Um, I want to welcome everybody first, especially our visitors. If y'all need a Bible, there should be one around your pew there close to you. And I said our subject's going to be on love this morning. If you'd like to turn your Bibles to 1 John 4, 7 through 12. That's kind of a coincidence what Terry just read, wasn't there? But anyway, our purpose this morning is God requires us to show compassion and love to those in need. Our objective this morning will be people need to be more open-minded and compassionate. 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God is manifested among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love not that we have loved God, but that he, had, that he loved us and sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Now, can you imagine people in here has got kids and or grandkids or nieces or nephews? Could you imagine sending one of them to go through what Jesus did? Could you imagine watching that? What God had to go through to watch his own son be tortured for a lot of undeserving people? I mean, I can't imagine somebody tracking one of my family members one time without me wanting to fight over it. And, you know, that's got to be ultimate. I mean, that's a love we don't understand. Maybe I shouldn't say we, but me. That it's just hard for me to understand that you could let your only son be tortured for people that were undeserving. You know, you just think about one of your own kids or your kin folks. You know, I don't probably everybody in here will try to help fight. We just all die at the same day, is all I know. All right, let's turn to 1 Peter 4 8. 4 8. First Peter 4 8. Above all, <coughs> keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sin. Now as I know, now as I learn more about the Bible, I learn things that I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be doing this. You know, I was just ignorant of it and didn't know no different. But this here is one of my favorite things in the Bible. The love covers a multitude of sin. That, that makes me feel good. That if you just love one another, it's going to cover some of your mistakes. That's the easiest thing there is to do, to love one another. And we know it's easy to love our kids, our grandkids, our kinfolk, most of them. But... When you come to loving a stranger or helping your neighbor, you know, a lot of people clams up. Every time I help my neighbors or send them some food or something, I think it may be selfish. It just makes me feel better. Um, but if 
you think about it that way, the love covers a multitude of sin. It gets a whole lot easier to, to love one another and try to help them. Let's turn to Psalms 24. Psalm 24, 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the rivers. So I don't know if I understand this completely, but the Lord created everything. It's all the Lord's. We're the Lord's. Everything he built the Lord's. Everything you accomplish in this life is the Lord's. He lets us use it a little while while we're here and it stays here. We go on. So I just want you to keep that on your mind as we turn to Mark 12, 41 through 44. Mark 12, 41 through 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in a large sum. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which made a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Surely I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had and all she had to live on. Now, you know, I don't know, lots of times I feel guilty. If I spend some money uselessly somewhere, and then I get thinking about the kids in India where Terry goes sometimes, and things like that, I, I don't know. I kind of beat myself up. I used to never, but I can tell my life's changing. Years ago, I went to a, a gambling boat. I lost a little money and I was up in Napa telling Larry about it. There was a man there that went to church and he was kind of frowning looking at me over there. And I said, I said, do you think that's wrong for me to go over to the boat and lose a little money? I don't have no kids. I wasn't taking food out of their mouths. <coughs> he said, well, let me ask you this morning, is there something you could have done with that money that would have done more good? And I said, yeah. He said, well, there's your answer. Well, he bought a pickup, and he put little lights all over it and decorated it up. It was all useless. And so I asked him, I said, is there something you could have done with that money that would have been more helpful, more useful? Well, yeah, yeah, you got a point. But that's probably been 15 years ago, and that stuck in my head. And as you become a Christian, it just weighs on me harder and harder. You know, I was kind of rebelling, being a little smart, and come back to point out his problems. But you can't worry about other people's problems. You better just worry about your own. I'm talking about <coughs> what makes your conscience clear. And so over the years, that's just weighed on me. And I've been a Christian for four and a half years, and it keeps weighing on me harder. I, I don't know, probably some of y'all's the same way, maybe all of you are, but it's a pressure that you don't, that 
that you will surrender to after a while, I guess. So let's turn to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. When the man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you drink? And when would we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when, would you, when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me. You cursed, and you're cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not minister you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. You know, that's about as plain as it gets when you talk about helping someone. You know, we talked about everything we got is the Lord's. And if we, somebody asks us for help, it ain't just, it ain't just the right thing to do. It's our obligation. It's orders from the Lord. You know, that gets to be pretty serious sometimes. So, I was I was talking to a man about coming to church and this and that. And he was kin to me. He was, he's kind of rough to talk about. He can't even say God. He said, you know, if there's a superpower... How come all these kids are starving in the world? So you got to be awful careful how you answer it because it's going to try to twist me up. And I said, well, we're all here on this earth for a short period of time. If it's 10 years or 110, it's still a short period. I've explained this to him. I said, we're just under a test, under a trial. What we do every day, what we accumulate over our years, is what we'll be rewarded for and what we'll answer for. 
I said, now, you've been pretty successful in life. I said, you ever send them kids any money to help feed them? I said, you know, maybe, maybe the Lord, they say, works in mysterious ways. Maybe it's his purpose to let kids, people suffer and things to see what good people will do about it. You know, I, I, that's the only explanation I can understand that, you know, it's not right for me to be 50 pounds overweight and them to be 50 pounds underweight. You know, it just don't seem right to me. So that's the only conclusion I can come to is that, that that may be the purpose of everybody not being equal. To see what good people does when unfortunate people suffer. Do you ever think about that that way, anybody? You know, I'm not expecting you to answer. I'm just pointing it in your head that you ever think about stuff like that. You know, we have some, we have very few people in town that's unfortunate. Most, all of them got a roof over their head. You know, and they're not really starving. They're, they may be hungry once in a while, but it's, we're not in the actual position to go door to door helping people. But when we go to India, or there you go, or we send money to help them folks, it is, way more appreciated, this is my opinion, way more appreciated than it is if you help people that are drawing, you know, some kind of help or whatever. It's really eaten, you know, but you just help them a little bit. Let's turn to Matthew 10, Matthew 10, 42. <laughs> Matthew 10, 42. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. He will by no means lose his reward. That's pretty simple, ain't it? To give somebody a cup of water that needs help. When you, when you love the Lord, he says love, the, love him with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, when you love people, or you're compassionate, I, I believe it's mainly the same thing. It's pretty simple to help folks in need. You know, to, I've made plenty of excuses in the past and life to man, you know, they don't need help or justify it somehow or whatever. I mean, you know, that's another thing I feel bad about. That I can always figure out a loophole. I don't know where I'm at exactly. I've got to turn this thing to me. I'm going to be like Jacob. I'm going to run over time. I'm turned up. Romans 5, 6 through 11. This is a godly example of love. Romans 5, 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we are, for if while, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, 
we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. I got a little tip note down here that I've, I talked about before, but to love your kids and love your family is easy most of the time. But to love strangers, to somebody that don't dress the same or somebody that don't look the same or this and that, I would say would strain most, most people. Strains me sometimes. But I'm trying to grow and learn and do better and to think about that too. I'll just skip on here to 1 John 4, 19. 1 John 4, 19. It's pretty short. We love because he first loved us. God didn't owe us nothing, but he loved us. If he loved us enough to send his son, then shouldn't we show love to one another? Shouldn't we love? What does it matter if we go out of this world with nothing? We're going out of nothing. That's a fact. But what does it matter if we help folks abundantly along the way? It may not matter to us, but I believe it's going to matter to the Lord. If, I, if, if one of us sent our son to <coughs> die for people that was unworthy, we'd expect a whole lot out of him, wouldn't we? You know, I would probably be disappointed a whole lot. So, I just want you to think about that when you come across that situation. Most of the time I think about, ah, oh, they, don't, they don't really need help. They don't this, they don't that. They're undeserving. Well, we're all undeserving. And I think we all know that. In conclusion here, I'm going to tell you a little story that may stick in your mind. Me and my mother was headed up to Park Hills five or six, seven years ago. Y'all love my mother. I'm in a wheelchair. We're sitting there, and she's got food all in the floor. We're taking up for Thanksgiving. We get about halfway between Campbell and Park Hills. We have a flat on the man. She pulls to the edge of the road. I can't even get out of the man. And if she got out, it wasn't going to help nothing. She couldn't change that flat. So we called my brother-in-law, and he's an hour away. And two trucks passed, and they turned in a driveway right past with both trucks. I told Mama, I said, I think they're coming back to help us. So they came back and helped us. And while the man was helping us, he told us a story about three or four years before that. It was snowing real bad, but the person had their hood up, and he stopped to help them. And while he was, he got out, it was, uh, one man standing there. When he got out, two more jumped out of the ditch and attacked him. Of course, I said, well, did they get you? And he said, no. No, I got them. You know. And I said, how? After that happens to you, how do you still stop and help folks like this? And he said, well, it's just the right thing to do. So, when you come across these things in the world that, to help people, to help your neighbors, to love one another, just always remember it's the right thing to do. The consequences don't matter. If you help somebody and you get burnt, that's okay. That's on their hands, not on yours. It's the right thing to do. Well, that's about all I got to say on the subject, but if uh, anyone would need a prayer, needs any help, if you need to be saved, the Bible says, hear the word, believe in your heart, <coughs> confess Jesus as the Son of God, repent of your sins, 
and be baptized. If anyone's in need of that this morning, there's a whole lot of folks here who'd be proud to help you. If you want to come forward as we sing our last song here, we're, we're more than proud to help you. We can help you with anything. Come forward as we sing. <laughs>